will be trouble. Of course, machines can't think as people do. The machine is different. Good evening, everybody. Whoa. Um, thank you for coming, and thank you, uh, Andrew and Bree and uh, Eric and Jesse, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here to introduce this important film tonight. You know, this is so Minnesotan, right? It's 82 degrees today. Yes. It's the warmest day in like seven months. And so, what do we do? We come inside and watch a, a theater, a movie about ice and snow. <laughs> that's that's what we do in Minnesota. Give yourselves a round of applause. Uh, they asked me to put together a few comments beforehand, so we're just going to take about 10, 15 minutes, kind of talk about the state of climate in Minnesota and around the globe and as it ties to ice on the planet leading up to this movie. So if you'll bear with me for Uncle Paul's slideshow here, we'll go through a couple of these. And uh, thanks to everybody for inviting me. Climate change, right? It's a hot topic. It can get a little heated at times, so we always try to maintain a sense of humor as we look for lines of evidence uh, in climate change. And it turns out, it's rather surprising, that one of the most important lines of evidence is actually the clothesline. Um, if you look back through time, you can see that <laughs> that's proof positive of climate change. <laughs> Got to have a sense of humor in this business. So what is weather, what is climate? Well, we know weather is a month, a season, a year, right? Climate is averages over decades, and that's why folks who study climate change are so concerned because they're seeing these averages over decades begin to move very rapidly. Weather is your mood, how you're feeling today. Climate is more your personality. It's a longer term average, if you will. And congratulations because you've just come through the 10th least miserable winter on record in Minnesota. Only in Minnesota do we have a winter misery index. That's uh, the people at the Minnesota Climate Working Group. They do great work, and uh, here we are for this year. If you look at all the dots here, and they add up points for sub-zero days, for snowfall, uh, for bitter wind chills, we were at one of the uh, mildest winters on record uh, going back to 1900. So we got off pretty easy this year. But that's weather. Weather is one mild winter. Climate change is winters that are four degrees warmer in Minnesota than they were in 1910. So as you start to look around the nation as a whole, Minnesota is actually the fastest warming state in the United States in winter. The farther north you go, the farther toward the poles you go, especially the more climate change uh, is ex accelerating. And we're warming at a rate of about a degree and a quarter per decade over time in Minnesota. So if you add that up and do the math, that gets a little scary going forward. Because in winter, we're looking at temperatures in a century 11 degrees warmer than they are now. So think about a Minnesota with winters that on average, not every year, right? We still have ups and downs from year to year. But we're about 11 degrees warmer in Minnesota. We're already starting to see some of those changes. How do we observe that in Minnesota? This is just one way. Remember March 2012, uh, four years ago when it was uh, green grass, no snow, and a star magnolia blooming in my neighborhood near the weather lab. But if you look at harder data, these trends are showing up very pronounced in Minnesota in winter. We're seeing the number of sub-zero days plummet. Uh, it's trending much, much lower over time. Again, each year is different. We had a couple of respectable winters, and then we're having more winters on average, though, like the one we had this year. Our growing season is extending across all of the United States and here in the upper Midwest as well. Uh, not saying that's a good or a bad thing. I guess it depends whether you're a farmer or an allergy sufferer, right? Uh, and nobody likes a longer growing season if you're allergic to certain things. And it's proof that even a novice like me can grow roses in November in Minnesota. This was uh, from last year when I walked out in mid-November and took that photo. So we're seeing the growing season extend. And if you look at how long it's extending, it's about three weeks longer on average in Minnesota since the 1870s. The extreme temperatures in winter, I don't know how many of you remember the winters of the 70s? Any of you were around here? Yeah, and when we had a lot of sub-zero days and very, very cold years, 
And you can see those on the chart. This is how the coldest temperature in winter every year, how cold it got, the, the absolute coldest temperature that winter. And you can see how that is changing as well. So Jack Falker, who's a rose gardener, sent me this. Uh, he charts the coldest temperature every year. And you can see that our zones are changing, our climate zones for what we can plant and what we can grow here. And in fact, they've changed the hardiness zones for Minnesota. Uh, and so now we're being able to grow some things here that we weren't able to grow a long time ago. The downside of that, though, can be too, and 40 below is a magic number. If you talk to people like Lee Freilich at the University of Minnesota, when it gets to 40 below zero in northern Minnesota in winter, it is a very high mortality rate for pests for the forest, like pine bark beetles. So if we hit that 40 below, we're keeping those pests at a minimum. In the winters, when we don't hit it, they survive and multiply, and the trees become much more vulnerable to those kind of pests. So it's important, actually, that it gets bitterly cold in Minnesota in winter. This year, uh, you know, again, weather is an early ice out. We had one of the earliest ice outs this year. But climate change is when we start to lose two weeks of ice cover on average since the 1950s. And if you look at ice out this year, this was White Bear Lake. We did have many record early ice outs, not every lake, but many. This was White Bear, which had a record early ice out this year on March 16th. And if you look at the bottom there, the period of record going back to 1928, that's a pretty impressive record. Tonka, uh, Bellwether Lake in the Twin Cities, was the second earliest ice out on record this year. And you can see the dates there over time. And if you look at a lake like Lake Osakis, which has west central Minnesota, that has one of the longest records, you start to see those longer term trends. We're losing ice cover in general at the rate of about one to two weeks overall, about a week in fall and a week in the spring. Our precipitation patterns are changing. Weather is one three inch rainfall. Climate change is a doubling of three inch rainfall frequency in Minnesota since 1960. It's raining harder in Minnesota because there's more moisture, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. So when it does rain, it's raining harder. We had three 1,000 year floods in southern Minnesota uh, since uh, 2004, so in the last uh, 12 years or so. And of course we had uh, the Duluth flood as well. But if you look at this, we're getting wetter in Minnesota while the west is getting drier. I'm not sure that we know why that's happening yet. But in the places that do keep the water vapor, it's raining harder when it rains. And we're seeing that increase in heavy rainfall frequency in the Midwest and in the eastern U.S. Folks in Duluth remember this. This was the flood uh, back a few years ago there. That was a 500 to 1,000 year flood event there. Not the best place to be parked for this person on this day. Uh, fortunately, nobody was injured in this situation. But if you look at the key climate change data points in Minnesota, and I won't go through all these, you can see them, but winters are warming four to five degrees on average, and rainfall is getting heavier in Minnesota. Our hydrologic cycle is accelerating and it's changing. And these are both marks of climate change and really what was theorized decades ago as climate change moves forward. So in my world at Minnesota Public Radio, about three and a half years ago, I went to my managers and I said, you know what, guys? We need to do something about reporting on climate science. There's so much climate science coming out every week that is not getting reported both locally here and on a national level that we really should do a show on this. And they agreed, thankfully, so we started ClimateCast three years ago at Minnesota Public Radio. And we'll cover any any topic related to climate science. It could be a variety of things. Uh, you know, we might report about uh, lakes warming faster than oceans, methane leaks. Uh, we had a great show, I thought, on Friday about how corporations are really starting to go green on climate change. We had representatives from Best Buy and from Ecolab and 3M and General Mills uh, having a discussion about that. And they're not doing it just for the, the feel good reasons of going green, they're doing it because they're getting more green on their bottom line. Best Buy alone saves $42 million a year by reducing their carbon footprint and becoming more climate friendly. So that's what we do. We, we report on the latest evolving climate science. We try to communicate a very complex science uh, and make obscure trends seem more meaningful. 
and relate it to people as best we can. And we really avoid policy. We don't advocate as a news organization, but we try to report the science and let people make their own decisions. Quickly, just a look at global trends. We are at 400 plus parts per million now. That is the highest level of CO2 in uh, as many as 3 million years on the planet. And it's not just Mauna Loa. There are many other sites around the globe that are measuring this. We know that global temperature and CO2 work in lockstep. And if you look at all the charts and the trends, you see the same sort of signal. What's really remarkable about this last year, though, was 2015 was not only the warmest year on record after 2014 was the warmest year on record, but it was the amount that just stunned a lot of climate observers and how far above all the other uh, highest years, warmest years on record globally. And guess what? Apparently we're not done because here's 2016 compared to 2015 and 2014 and 2010. And we are off the charts just about already this year. Part of this is this the super El Nino that was heating up the atmosphere in the Pacific uh, and delivering that heat into the atmosphere. Some folks think that'll bump that trend line down a little bit as we go through the end of the year because that's fading. But part of it is the background hum of what we call climate change. If you look at the warmest 10 or 15 years globally, take a look at that list. All of them have occurred since 1998. Just a remarkable run of warmth. And a lot of that has been in the Arctic. Uh, and that's something that's going to be very interesting in this film. Uh, we've seen incredible warmth near the poles, especially near the North Pole. We're in a situation now where we're at record low Arctic ice around the North Pole. I know we'll be focused more on Antarctica here. Uh, with the film coming up shortly. So globally, key points on climate change. All of the 16 warmest years have occurred since 1998. If you are, excuse me, if you are uh, younger than, what, 39 years old, you have never lived through a cooler than average year globally. If you're under 31, you've never lived through a cooler than average month globally. That's an incredible run. Take those odds to Vegas. Uh, and we're seeing a peak now, last year, about one degree Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels, and that's halfway to the IPCC's goal of two degrees. So what are the odds of that run of warmth? Well, Climate Central ran them, and it's one in 27 million that this would be anything other than human-caused climate change. In other words, that it would be a naturally occurring event that we'd see this incredible run of warmth. Anybody who's skeptical? So, so for, if you look at those years, that string of warm years, the odds of that being a naturally occurring event are one in 27 million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> Buy a lottery ticket. Um, and so anybody that's really skeptical about it because you hear a lot of the sort of myths about climate change, this is an excellent website called Skeptical Science. It's peer-reviewed science that answers all of these climate myths. So check that out, or if your uncle or brother or whatever just says it ain't happening, well, you, you've got some ammunition here. All of the signs that we're seeing and have expected in a warming world are in fact happening, so that's more ground truth. And if you look at Minnesota and our projections, we're actually forecast, the, this is the one important takeaway from this map here is the 44 degree isotherm annual average, which is in the Twin Cities back at the turn of the century, is around International Falls by the end of this century. So the climate of Minneapolis is moving to International Falls, folks. We're also seeing more weather whiplash with the hydrologic cycle from flood to drought. The rain gets turned on and off. And with that warming, our maple trees and our forests are changing as well. You can see how the center of the density of maples in Minnesota is shifting forward. There are maples now in the boundary waters. So is all weather colored by climate change? Well, some people are starting to say yes. When you warm the atmosphere and add more moisture, you're changing the nature of every storm system that comes through. So there is more and more what we call attribution evidence that individual weather events are being affected by climate change. I like to say expect the unprecedented. What can we expect going forward? More volatility in our weather, milder winters overall. That's where the strongest warming signal will continue to be in Minnesota. We'll see an increased frequency of these extreme rainfall events 
shifting migration patterns uh, and biomes, uh, landscape vegetation in Minnesota, and less lake ice cover and warmer lake temperatures in summer as well. What do we do about it? Well, these are the two main things, right? You've seen this, mitigation and adaptation. We try to reduce the carbon we're putting into the atmosphere and we try to adapt to what's already there. And as far as what you can do personally, EPA has a pretty good website if you're looking for actionable things in your own life to tackle climate change. Thank you so much for having me today uh, and I'm looking forward to this film. And without further ado, I will introduce you to Ice in the Sky. Thank you very much.